See, this is an interview with Bruce Squires at the New York State Military Museum, Saratoga Springs, New York, 3rd of February 2004, approximately 9.15 a.m. Interviewers are Mike Russert and Wayne Clark. Could you give me your full name, date of birth, and place of birth, please? My name is Bruce Squires. Date of birth is 1-14-49. And place of birth, you said? Yes, sir. Uh, Cambridge, New York. All right. Uh, what was your educational background prior to entering service? Uh, high school graduate. Okay. Did you, uh, were you drafted or did you enlist? I enlisted. Why did you uh, decide to enlist? Well, that's a more complicated question than, than you, know, you might think. Um, I come from a family that most men uh, within my family have served in, in, in the military. Mm -hmm. um, and as early as early high school, I, I kind of knew if the Vietnam War was going on, I was probably going to be part of it. Um, I, my only question was how how was I going to go in? Was I going to let myself be drafted? Was I going to enlist in the Navy, the Army, the Air Force, whatever? Um, the answer made itself uh, answered itself in uh, early '68. The Vietnam War was at its really its peak, I suppose. The Tet Offensive had just occurred, and I'd seen that on television. I had a cousin who had just dropped out of Plattsburgh State University, and he was about to go in the Army. And I had just lost my job because of it. it was a seasonal type job, and this would have been early 68. And, and he said, well, let's, it won't hurt. Let's go talk to a recruiter or two. Well, let's go to Troy. We took a day. We hitchhiked down to Troy from Cambridge. And we talked to a couple of recruiters, uh, Navy, Army, and Air Force, I think. Um, I was always interested in aviation, and I had a recruiter uh, tell me, the Army recruiter in Troy had told me that, well, you can be a high school graduate and become a helicopter pilot. And that's just what I wanted to hear. And so he said, but you have to go through a battery test, and you have to do this, and you have to do that, and you have to go to Syracuse and get interviewed, and are you interested? And I said, well, by this time, as, as I said, the Vietnam War was at its peak, I suppose. I, was, I had already gotten a pre-induction physical. I was 19 years old and 1A, and I knew it was just a matter of time before I either went in the Army or the Army called me. It was, there was no ifs, ands, or buts, and I didn't, I didn't mind. I was going to go anyway, as I said. <clears throat> so I took the uh, warrant officer route, and that's how I, I joined the Army. I became an infantryman because uh, later on, maybe we'll get to this a little, a little later in the interview, I I found out I didn't like the, the bureaucracy of the Army, the, the Mickey Mousiness of it, or at least what I thought it was. Uh, and um, so I resigned from Warren Officer School in Texas and hoping I, I would still stay in aviation, but the Army had other plans for me and uh, made, made myself and, and pretty much all the other resignees uh, in Fort Walters, uh, infantrymen. Were you flying at all at that point? No. I, had, I hadn't gone through the, into the flying phase You're yet. Still in the ground it school. was still on ground school. Mm -hmm. Where did you, uh, when were you inducted and where did you go for your basic? Um, I, I was, I had my pre-induction physical yeah, in, the, uh, in Albany. I wasn't in the Army yet. This mm -hmm. was to see if you were material, I guess. I think that was it almost been it down for you. It was around March of 68, February or March, about this time of year. And I passed that, and I was basically just waiting, and that's when I went and talked to recruiters. As they say, I knew it was a matter of time one way or the other that I was going to go into military. Mm -hmm. um, I was, uh, so I went through this initial process with the recruiter that I spoke about in Troy. I had to take a battery of tests and pass those. Um, and then I had to go to Syracuse at my expense. And it was the first time I'd actually ever been on an uh, uh, airline. Uh, and 
and I took what was then Mohawk Airlines from Albany to Syracuse, and I had to go to, I think it was a federal, the federal building in Syracuse. I don't remember it, where it was now, except that it was in downtown Syracuse, but I found it all right. And uh, a bunch of uh, officers screened me and asked me questions about, you know, I, I think they just wanted to see if you were emotionally stable or whatever, uh -huh. that kind of thing, and, and passed me. So uh, then it was just a, it was a fairly quick process from that there on because the draft was, was, was really something that was hanging on young men in 1968. And my recruiter, I, I don't know if he was telling me the truth or not, but he said that you better go in right away and we have a class forming up and, uh, you know, so they put you into, into the cycle. Uh, I had very little time between that trip to Syracuse and the time I went into the Army. He said, otherwise, you can still be drafted. Even though we're putting you in this program, you can be drafted because you're not in yet. So um, I said, well, why not? I'm going. You know, it doesn't matter. So sure. Uh, no, I don't think it was two weeks later. Uh, I was uh, on my way to uh, Fort Polk, Louisiana and for basic training. And that's where they, they trained, I guess, warrant officer candidates because it was relatively near um, Fort Walters, Texas, where they did the, the pre-flight training at the time for warrant officer candidates it's over the border. And uh, so I, I spent uh, a lovely summer in Louisiana and then went over to Texas. How long were you there approximately? <laughs> If in basic training, I think it was eight weeks eight at the weeks. time. So you had the full eight weeks of yeah. basic training. Yeah, 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 And And there were only a couple of us from, and again, there were a couple of Warren officer candidates like myself, and we, we were all from the, the, the greater capital district area. Um, but there were only about three of us in my particular unit. And most, most of the people were from the, as you might expect, in Fort Polk. They're for, they were from the south or the southeast, as a rule. Now, was this your first time really away from home? Yeah, or? really. Uh, I had taken a couple of, you know, day trips and things of that sort. But And I had a couple of friends in college, and I guess I spent a weekend or two, uh, you know, that kind of thing. But this was my first real, my first real experience of being on my own and away from home. Um, could you tell us about the warrant officer training and well I, I, I didn't how long did you stay very in that? very little time um, I had what what did it for me I guess is is I uh, <coughs> I had just gotten to Fort Walters and I had developed from basic training in Louisiana <coughs> uh, some sort of ulcer on my on my foot and it was uh, very painful and it got swollen and red and it basically it, it was a, f a form of blood poisoning but it wasn't blood poisoning but it put me in the hospital uh, my my flight instructor or floor instructor or whatever he was at the time he he looked at it and says you 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 gotta you gotta go to the hospital <laughs> and uh and fortunately for me, Fort Walters was a very nice place um, because they had flight surgeons in the hospital. And it was very high class care, and and um, um, I had this this very stubborn uh, infected streak going up my leg, and it was it was a concern for a while. Um, but eventually, the flight surgeon got it under control, and he was able to uh, use various soakings of some kind that drained it and it, it mm -hmm. eventually healed. Well, to make a long story short, he said, well, I can't put you back on duty right now, so go take a medical leave. Uh, take a week and go home. And, and that's, I guess, what kind of did it for me. I felt, I, I, I was a very immature kid. I was 19 years old and never been away from home. And I said, I, I don't know if I, I think I bit off more than I can chew here. I'm not a pilot, I'm not of this, I'm not of that. And I thought about this and hemmed and hawed and, and, you know, I, I was, I've 
I I liked going back home, and when I went back to Fort Walters, I, I basically said, I don't want to do this, and I resigned. And it wasn't uncommon. The washout rate was 60% or something. And at the time, I had hoped, I had hoped, I still liked aviation, as I alluded to, and I was hoping I could become a, a door gunner or a, a aviation mechanic or something around helicopters. I, I love I love the flying part. And uh, but the army just put me on hold for about two months. They basically pulled warrant officer resignees, and we worked at various jobs at Fort Walters. It was a very nice space. Very nice. It was a very nice experience. I was working a regular eight-hour day on the rifle range. And the sergeant who ran the rifle range was a very accommodating, very very nice, uh, decent man. And as long as you did your job, you had no problem with him. So it was almost a regular day. We'd work the rifle range from, oh, I suppose 9 to 5 or 8 to 4. I don't remember the exact hours. And we went home at night and and uh, hung out. And uh, on the weekends, we Fort Walters was in a place called Mineral Wells, Texas. Very small town, cute town, um, <clears throat> but we were only about an hour from uh, Dallas, so we would on the weekends usually thumb a ride or catch a lift or whatever and go to Dallas for the weekend and come back Monday. It was a nice time. And uh, eventually we, I, I got orders to uh, go back to Fort Polk, and it was going to be uh, infantry training. And uh, I knew what that meant. Okay. Um, so, did you receive any specialized uh, training, jungle warfare training, etc.? Or uh, all, all I received. How do you think your training? Do you think it prepared you for um, when you actually ended up in combat? Well, I, I don't. I don't think that. The, the training in, in that I received in uh, Fort Polk back, back in AIT, it was it was um, the climate of Fort Polk it was very much like Vietnam. I uh, I think that's why Fort Polk was a popular place at the time. Um, I remember stepping off the plane first day in Vietnam, first minute in Vietnam, and saying, "This place smells and feels just like Fort Polk." So. In that respect, Fort Polk was wonderful because it, it, it psychologically trains you for the uh, the uh, weather conditions or whatever. But uh, I, I I don't think the training was 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 that good. Um, I I had to learn a lot of things in Vietnam when I got there that I that I didn't even know or was exposed to in Fort Polk. Um, the weapons training was pretty good. That was that was very good. Um, I had a very good drill sergeant in, in in AIT advanced infantry training in Fort Polk, and he was a Vietnam veteran himself, and and he was a very uh, decent person. And he, he had, we we actually had a pretty good time. There's something I guess it's like a gallows humor. A lot of my class in AIT was warrant officer dropouts. We all knew where we were going, and we all knew what we were going to be doing. And, and so we had a lot of fun in AIT, a lot of fun, because our, our, common, our common phrase was, what are you going to do, hand me a gun and send me to Vietnam? I mean, of course you are, you know. And, and uh, so whenever we were threatened with recycling or, or you must learn this class to, to, to stay in your program or whatever, we'd say, well, does that mean more time in the United States or what, you know? So uh, we had a lot of fun, and, but our DI was very good. And he was very good in the sense that I remember him specifically um, saying, Look, guys, I don't care if you fool around a little bit, because you know, I, know, I know where you're going to, you know. And, and he was good because he had been there. He told us some things. And, and he tried to impart on us when we'd get to a certain training. training set. I mean, we had a lot of different training. We had, we had to train on various weapons, the train on first aid, land navigation. And our drill sergeant was very good at, 
at sorting through that and saying, you've got to know this. This is important. It could save your life. Do it, you know. And But other things, don't worry about it. You know, go see it, you know. And, and, and he was very good at helping us sort through that stuff, so. Uh, I guess to get, answer your, your question, was the training adequate? I guess it was adequate, mm -hmm. but w was it um, complete? No, mm -hmm. no, I, 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 I didn't uh, learn how to make bunkers and things when I was in Louisiana. No. How long was your advanced training? I think that was either eight or twelve weeks, mm -hmm. something like that. I think it was. I think it was probably eight weeks. I think they were sh had shortened it. And again, it was just things you needed to learn to become an infantryman, basically. Mm -hmm. Did you leave right from there for Vietnam? No, I had a month, almost a month leave. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, it was a nice time. It was right around Christmas of uh, 1968. And I, I spent most of the holidays at home. And then I went to Vietnam in the middle of January of 69. And stayed there for a year. Um, where were you assigned? Uh, where were you assigned in Vietnam? What unit? And well, the way they do that is is I didn't even know when I when I went over where, mm -hmm. uh, where exactly where I was going. Um, my initial orders were for uh, just Oakland, California, which was a code word for you getting on the plane to Vietnam, and you had to sort of figure that out. Um, <clears throat> I spent a couple of days in Oakland, and then the Army's bureaucracy being what it is, then you eventually get to a point where your name is, is drawn and you're on the next plane, you know, going across the Pacific. Um, we went to, uh, uh, we landed in Vietnam at Benoit Air, For Air Base which is at the south side of Saigon. Um, the Army would, and I, I'm sure this is very typical, they would break it down. Uh, it isn't what most people envision where you just, you're handed a gun and said go to work. It, 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 you're spent, I spent a couple of weeks, I think something like a couple of weeks you know, around Benoit, and they try to give you some essential training that, they, that you didn't get in the United States. And, and try to show you, you know, you're in Vietnam now, and this is what it looks like, and this is what it feels like, and you're still not ready for the field, but we're getting you ready. And then they just kept breaking it down and breaking it down and breaking it down. Then I got my orders uh, for the 4th Infantry Division, which was out of Play Coup. Almost the same pattern. I go to play coup, fairly major base. I'm still not, quote unquote, in the field. And again, more more exposure. You're taught, you're 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 with guys that have been through or had considerable experience, and some would scare the hell out of you, some wouldn't. And again, they're just trying to show you here's what you need to know, here's what you really don't need to know. And and there's a lot of dirty business like. Uh, uh, they give you the dirty work, like guard duty at night, or 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 burning the uh, the uh, human feces in the barrel with kerosene uh, because you're the new guy, and we're going to use senior. And there was uh, some of that too. And from that experience, um, I got on a helicopter and flew to a fire base and again it's just a breakdown the fire base fairly heavily supported and fortified there's artillery there's heliports there's this and that but you definitely know you're you're not in uh, a particularly civilized area anymore and then from the fire base you just literally went out to your uh, battalion and your company you that whole process took two or three weeks. Mm -hmm. You said you were under fire almost as soon as you arrived. Uh, I came into a hot area. Mm -hmm. uh, we were we were, my 
my particular unit was always near the Cambodian border. We were I, we were probably in Cambodia at times without being told. We, we spent all our time near Cambodia, and my first three or four months was 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 my most difficult. Um, I didn't think I'd get out of here alive. Um, I literally got off the helicopter along with the ammo supplies and 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 uh, and looked up and they said here go over there you know it was it was that kind of thing you know and go to work uh, and you're on patrol tonight you know <laughs> so it was it was very it was it was very uh, enlightening to say the did least. those that were already there help break you in and um for the most part we had a we had a very Good uh, platoon sergeant, and and he was he was a fairly understand he he knew I think what you were feeling. Mm -hmm. He was a good man, and he would try to uh, work with you. But in the field like that, you're very short staffed, and they don't really have time to uh, be too compassionate or too nice. I mean, they literally go, "Hey, we need a guy on a listening post tonight. Mm -hmm. Guess what? You're going." You're it. Here's what you need to know. You go to work. and, and it's, it's it's that way. It's that way. So there's a lot of on-the-job training. You so bet. You bet. You bet. Right away. Yeah. Now you said that you found combat was often chaos. What do you mean by that? Just that. I I don't. I think that if there's a word I could use to describe combat, it's chaos. Um, I I love. I'm a history nut, but I I love to go to battlefields like Saratoga, Gettysburg. And, but I always find a bit of a fallacy in that the, the uh, guide at a typical battlefield will say, well, then, you know, th this happened and General so-and-so moved his troops over here. And I find actual combat is it, things happen almost on their own. And they aren't these well-organized, well-orchestrated, um, um, heavily almost choreographed events that sometimes you get the impression of when you visit a, a, a battlefield. Uh, war, battles just happen. And things happen. And chaos is, is the word. And somehow, if you're lucky, you survive that maelstrom and learn from it, I guess. Um, the first combat death I saw that might be of interest uh, was 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 actually almost um, kind of. Uh, I wondered how I was how I was going to be because I I don't see myself as a uh, John Wayne kind of guy, um, but I also see myself as a semi macho guy maybe. Um, but I wondered how I was going to react when I when I saw bodies. And the first, I guess, fortunately for me, the first one was relatively easy. Uh, one of the relatively new guys was out on, on LP. I was in the perimeter that particular night. <clears throat> and we had movement, which was no surprise. We had movement almost every night in our perimeter. There's the NVA. We, we fought the NVA, very little Viet Cong. And they were always testing, you know, where are the wires, where are the claymores, where are the Americans awake, where are they asleep, where can we strike if we want, and just always, always, always looking for the weak spots. And, and uh, one particular night, um, one, of the, one of these probers uh, got in the wrong place at the wrong time, and one of our relatively new guys... Uh, uh, shot him and killed him instantly and and of course the next morning we all went out and you know it's, it's like shop talk and and uh, let's look at the guy that he shot and see what happened and, and uh, I, it was a it was pretty much a clean wound and it wasn't particularly grotesque or or Sad, and I rem I remember thinking my dad was was quite a deer hunter, and I was a semi deer hunter, not a very good one. But I remember thinking, well, that's just like a the guy kind of reminds me of a shot deer, 
Um, it's just the same kind of thing. There's a, there's an entrance and exit wound. The guy's dead. But that's it. And uh, it wasn't uh, it wasn't too difficult. How were your feelings when you saw a first American killer? Do you recall that at all? Uh, you know, I don't. Um, I remember getting hardened, this is later on though, to death itself. And I think a, a lot of combat veterans have that experience where they just, after a while, you see bodies in almost every configuration. Um, and you just get, I, I don't say used to it, I wouldn't use that word, but you get hardened to it. You just say, well, it's one more or whatever. You you can't eat your meal next to a body or something. You, you wouldn't have thought of that or your first day over there, but by your last day, it's no big deal. It's that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Now, you mentioned uh, you carried probably uh, an M16. I carried an M16. But you said here in your uh, form that you wrote to us that you preferred an M14. I trained, I trained in Fort Polk on the M14, mm -hmm. and I... I just thought it was more of a traditional rifle, I guess, and it was more of a, it was a harder weapon to use than M14, um, because it was big, it's heavy, but I just felt, I felt more self-assured with, with an M14 than I did an M16, and I would say within, the, within my community at the time, a lot of, a lot of guys, the M16 was still a relatively new weapon. I think I think um, the United States issued it as a standard firearm in 1966 or 67. So this would have been a couple of years later. Um, there were a lot of M14 guys. <laughs> there were a lot of M16 guys. I was an M14 guy. Did you ever um, have problems with your M16? No. Uh, we had to, you had to pay attention to an M16. And uh, I think the year before. I uh, went over, there was a problem with M16's jamming. There was a story, anyways, about some guys who were trying to fire their weapons and the, the uh, rifles jammed, and the Army had modified the M16, and every, every M16 I saw in Vietnam had this thumb, uh, it's a pusher, uh, it's almost like a spring button, a spring-loaded button, and if your magazine didn't seat forward far enough, you could make it go forward by pushing this button. And they never had a problem with them from the time they put those in. You could always, I guess the problem with the original jamming M16s was that that, that slide, that, that thing that sealed the bolt, wouldn't quite come forward quite enough, and the firing pin wouldn't extend enough to fire the, the, the bullet and so on. Well, you could make it fire by pushing this thing, and you're basically just jamming the the, the bolt seat in place, and and uh, so it can fire. Did anybody um, uh, carry the M14 in your platoon? Not in my platoon. I saw some M14s over there. Mm -hmm. uh, there were some more or less unconventional units in in uh, Vietnam that were allowed a lot more free. We were we were ver we were very standard of the line. Infantry, you know, we do what the army tells you to do, and we carry their what they tell you to carry. There were there were some units that were allowed a certain amount of unconventionality. Uh, the K9 handlers, the the uh, special forces, the LERPs, uh, the reconnaissance guys. They were allowed a certain amount of freedom to carry and use what they wanted. I saw some M14s there, and those and my exposure to those people. So they were in very much in place. Uh, mm -hmm. There was, a, there was a very good reason that some guys carried M14s. Not only did they like the weapon more, but the M14 bullet was a 7.62 millimeter bullet. It's quite, quite a bit larger than M16. Um, it happened to be exactly the same bullet that the, the enemy carried in their AK-47s. Mm -hmm. So if you uh, got into a situation, you could, use, you could use their bullet as well as yours. How many uh, M79s were carried in the... An M79 platoon? was usually carried two to a platoon, I believe. Mm -hmm. uh, each squad would have an M79 man. Okay, and usually two or three squads to a platoon. Now, did he carry an M16 also? No. 
Just strictly the M79? He would be protected by M16 guys. That was the understanding. No, you, you really couldn't work both. Mm -hmm. And he would carry a variety of, of, of weapons. Uh, they, they had a, it was almost a flechette wound, almost like a giant shotgun. Mm -hmm. uh, would fire these little tiny arrows and it, it could give you a big burst of, of metal in front of you. Um, in high explosive rounds, that was the most common, the most typical, basically a grenade. Yeah. And then there were some, you could also fire flares and things. So it was kind of like a big bloop tube, really, mm -hmm. an M79. Yeah. And it was only it was a single shot. You only got one shot at a time. Right. Fire, shoot, fire, shoot, fire, shoot. So that's, it was, it was, uh, it wasn't always the most popular weapon because you didn't, you had to be careful with how you used <laughs> So those guys didn't carry like a 45 too? Or? It's a funny thing. The Army is, it was funny in Vietnam. I never carried a bayonet. I had bayonet training. I I never had a bayonet in Vietnam. Uh, I think the only, I only saw a few of them. Um, so I couldn't have used one if I wanted to, and believe me, I wouldn't have wanted to. Um, but um, the 45s, and this is what I was taught in the United States, were for machine gunners, medics, M79 guys, uh, anybody who, who, for whatever reason, didn't carry a standard rifle, didn't need a standard rifle. Um, I was for a while, I was an infantryman, so we traded jobs all the time. I was good friends with our machine gunner, so I became his assistant machine gunner. And the M60 guy really needed a 45. We used to spend hours talking about this, and they, but they wouldn't issue him one. So we would, we would have to leave the perimeter, you know, to answer nature's call, and we were just talking a matter of a few feet. But we never, ever, ever, ever traveled without something to shoot back with. And the machine gunner didn't want to take an M60 out in the bushes to relieve himself. And he should have had an, an, a 45 or something of that sort with him. Uh, he would usually just borrow somebody's M16 until he came back. Now you mentioned you were slightly wounded. Could you tell about that? I was on a uh, just another perimeter. We moved a lot. We went up and <laughs> we went up and down the Cambodian border pretty much all the time. And and uh, I was uh, I was on a. Uh, M79 that night. As I say, as an infantryman, you, sh you, you use everything, you do everything. One day you're the RTO, one day you're a rifleman, one day you're a... Um, whatever. Um, you do whatever needs to be done that day. And this particular night, I was on the perimeter, and I was handed an M79, and we were told uh, to fire them sporadically. Uh, just to keep, as I, as I alluded to earlier, our perimeters were almost always getting probed. And, and uh, what would typically happen is the perimeter would get probed. This was just such a routine where I was in the Central Highlands. The perimeter would get probed. They'd pace back down to the mountain. They'd set up mortars. They'd fire incoming. And there were times when this was almost a nightly occurrence. Well, to keep those kinds of people honest, we would occasionally have what would be called a mad minute, where we just unload everything. The captain, usually our our company was, was commanded by a captain-level officer, and he'd just order a mad minute, perhaps. It could be any time. It could be 3 in the morning. could be noon. And uh, we'd just fire everything we got for about one minute. And, and uh, other times, such as this particular night I'm discussing, I'd fire an M79 occasionally, you know, just, just in case people are out there. And uh, there were two or three M79s going off, you know, maybe the one I was at and maybe the guy three bunkers up. And uh, so I've... I've uh, Fired uh, 
an M79 and it was a high explosive round and the I felt a, a, a sharp a sharp feeling almost like a stone or something it hit my leg and uh, but it didn't it hurt but it didn't really wasn't excruciating pain it was just pain and um, later on I went down in the bunker we slept in bunkers and things I wanted to see if uh, if uh, I felt my leg was kind of wet so I got out a match and I I, f I, f I found a, a small hole, probably, I don't know if you can see this with a camera, but probably no bigger than that, mm -hmm. and in my pant leg, and I knew I had some, something went through in there. I was a little afraid to look, and so I dropped my pant, and there was a, there was a, there was a, there was a wound there. And but it, it it didn't really really hurt. It just hurt. It's like I say. It's, it's almost like getting a sharp stone or something. So I, uh, <clears throat> as I said, my good friend was the machine gunner. I remember he'd gotten hit by shrapnel at an ambush we had been in, in about the same place. <laughs> so I mean, I'm a kid. I'm stupid. And. I said, Ed, do you remember that time you got you got shot? Yeah, yeah. What what happened? What they do to you? Oh, really, nothing. They put a field dressing on. I went in and they they didn't even take the. I said, they take any, they do any surgery? Nah, wasn't that deep. Wasn't just just a couple little pieces of shrapnel. They didn't bother. They just said the hell with it. I said, okay, well, all right. And I, I felt relieved. I, I, you know, like I said, I'm just a kid. I, and 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 uh, so I was. The reason I was, I was hesitant to do anything is I was about to go on my first R and R. And <laughs> just knowing the army, I was afraid they'd they mess that up. So I put a field. I told my friend Ed about it. Yeah, I just put a field dressing. I put field dressings on it. It, it. it leaked a lot. It was a lot of blood and stuff. And and uh, but it didn't really hurt. So I was able to resume most of my normal activities. And and, and uh, I was only a few days from my R and R, and I got to Bangkok. And the thing had gotten pretty ugly because it, now it was it had gone from red to black, blue. <laughs> And and uh, so I I just basically spent a week in the pool. I decided that chlorophyll and the water from the pool and all that would be good for my wound. And you know what? It, it was. By the time I got my week over, the thing had healed up pretty good. So that that was the end of it, really. So you you don't know to this day if you've got shrapnel. Oh, I do. I can feel it. Wow. It's it's my friend. I can reach down there and feel that, every, and, he, and every once in a while it, it moves a little, and it reminds me it's there. So yeah. you never got a Purple Heart because you never. I didn't report it. Uh -huh. um, you mentioned uh, that this was one of your most interesting experiences. Well, it, yes, yes. Uh, as I said earlier, we used to get. A, that's nothing about combat. I mean, I think in the movies everybody thinks it's hand-to-hand -hand combat and charging up the hill. A lot. a lot of my combat was was getting incoming from the enemy. The NVA would would fire uh, maybe I don't know ten or twenty mortar rounds into our perimeter. Like I said earlier, they probe the perimeter, pace it off, lob a bunch of uh, of explosives into your perimeter. Sometimes kill people, sometimes not, and be gone by the time you could triangulate the position and blah blah blah. You know, they're gone, you know. But you know, you find out where they were, but not where they are. And so they fired sometimes gas, uh, CS gas, not poison gas or anything like that. But occasionally, usually it was high explosives, usually just grenade type stuff. 
um, but every once in a while they'd mix it up with uh, some CS gas, uh, which would give you, you know, like tear gas. And we did carry gas masks, but we we often lost them or didn't have them. We, but we were issued gas masks for that for that event. Um, we one particular time this with along with some some high explosives they they fired these um, uh, canisters which of which this is a copy and they they probably thousands of these fell on our perimeter I don't remember but there were a lot of them they would flow through the sky just for us to pick up and, and it was it's just a type of propaganda war if you did you read it yes it basically just says you know GIs don't let yourself be killed you know and we'll take care of you if you just surrender and you want to hold that up and I'll and, uh, zoom in on it yeah you can hold it right at your chest that he'll be able to zoom them in and <clears throat> this is a copy the the original is this slightly different color even but um this was a fairly rare occurrence. I, this isn't something that happened with great frequency. That's why I kept it. It was something of a novelty uh, to be the recipient of propaganda war because we did a lot of propaganda war to them. Um, we were always, they were always uh, dropping leaflets from helicopters. Um, we sometimes were, guide, yeah. you get it, were guided by people called Chu Hoys, which were former uh, North Vietnamese people who defected for whatever reason and and they were very good I will say that while I'm thinking of them they they gave their lives for us in many cases I mean these were these were these were good people to, to us and and they knew all the tricks because they were North Vietnamese and and uh, they they uh, w we would we would often you know uh, Tried to, the United States constantly did did the propaganda on on the NVA. You know, surrender, we'll take care of you. Blah blah blah. Uh, and uh, we tried at times to we actively tried to catch prisoners of war. It was sometimes we were under orders to try to. You know, you hear these stories about no take no prisoners. Well, I remember a couple times we were very much trying to get prisoners. Um, were you ever successful? Or? Uh, well, I, 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 our unit was. Mm -hmm. I personally wasn't. Um, um, we uh, we literally caught some guys in the bushes a couple times, uh, uh, surprised them, and caught a couple that way. Yeah, they were just kids, scared kids too, I guess. Mm -hmm. But we did we did have we did have some POWs. Yeah, once in a while. Uh, but anyway, to get back to I get long-winded sometimes. These leaflets were fired from mortars and basically tried to convince us to uh, to uh, surrender. And and uh, I think I alluded to it in my son. And one of my good friends, he's just he, he had to be there. I guess he he's reading it. Yeah, well, yeah, the two government is corrupt. Yeah, and Johnson's a crook. Yeah, I mean, just on and on. And on. But I don't like that part about, you know, we'll let you go home some days. I don't think so. <laughs> so uh, I don't, as far as I know, that was not, uh, that was not a particularly effective tactic used by the NVA. Did you ever it. have much contact with the South Vietnamese Army? I hated the South Vietnamese at the time. The people themselves or the Army or both? And I was I was typical of my of my crowd. Why was that? And I, I I'm ashamed of that now. But at the time, when I was there, I had I had much more respect for the NVA than I did the South Vietnamese, because we felt the Americans that we were fighting their war for them, and we were we were bleeding and dying and. We would, uh, oftentimes, <clears throat> we may be trucked in. We moved all the time, usually by helicopter, but sometimes by convoy or something. Every time we saw South Vietnamese, they were dressed better than us. 
They were guarding bridges and roads. They were in fortresses. They were in cities. They had better equipment. And we felt we were doing the bleeding. So, I mean, you put that together and it breeds a hatred. Were there ever any race relations problems in, within your unit? Just or? the opposite. Uh, that was one of the nice lessons I got from Vietnam. Uh, color meant nothing. We had Indians, we had blacks, we had some Asians, we had Puerto Ricans who were Hispanics, and, you know, Caucasians such as myself. It meant nothing. You did your job, you protected each other, and if you do that, we're, we're, we're good to go. Now, it's funny. <clears throat> There, there, there were some, there were some strained race relations, but never in the field. Um, when I would, if we had, say, a stand down, in our case, that would be on K or play coup. Uh, then, I never saw the tensions. I heard, I, but I, I was, I was in Vietnam when these things occurred. So I mean, I was, I wasn't ignorant of them. There were some fraggings and and so on, of, and, 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 and most of them were racially motivated in places like Pleiku. Uh, maybe a white officer would get fragged by a black enlisted man, or vice versa. And I didn't witness it myself, but I heard about it. But I did, I, I do have to say, when we were on, in a stand-down situation where we weren't in combat, um, there was some racial tension sometimes. Um, the, the, the blacks tended at the time to congregate together and that would, that would cause other resentments. And, but in the field, no, absolutely not, zero. No. How did you feel about the relief for Westmoreland? Were you there at all at that time? Or? No, I think, uh, I think I missed that. I think, uh -huh. he was cha I think he changed command in late 68. Yeah. Does that so, sound yeah, right? Yeah, I don't remember ever, ever dealing with the guy's uh -huh. name. Um, How I, about the election of, Link, or of, of Nixon? Uh, Nixon? <laughs> uh, well, that was kind of interesting. That was kind of interesting because... Um, he was just, he was really just became president when I went over there. Mm -hmm. And, and I, as far as most people could tell who had been there for a while, I mean, I was the new guy, so I had no, no, nothing to compare it to. Uh, things weren't much different. But as the year went on, uh, and Nixon, I think, was, was instrumental in this, for better or worse, he didn't want Americans going into active combat as much. He was withdrawing at the time. I remember I was over there when the, the first infantry unit that got like, deactivated, or at least sent back to the United States, was, uh, I think, the 9th Division, I think. I'm not sure about that, but I think it was the 9th Division. And... <clears throat> that was of some consequence to us uh -huh. because, well, the 9th Division is not that much different from the 4th Division. I mean, in terms of its structure and time over here and all that. And and uh, so uh, it, it meant something, but it, 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 it didn't mean a lot. Uh -huh. It didn't mean a lot. When did you go home? In January of 1970. Did you ever have any uh, problems when you went back into the United States? Yeah. Or? demonstrators on? Uh, yeah, I, I I think I touched upon it yes. in my word. I, when, when we arrived in Chicago, we got jeered, uh, literally jeered and spit on and called baby killers. And that was my first real exposure to that. Um, and I was uh, surprised. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I remember I had a, I had a, a platoon lieutenant in Vietnam. He was a West Pointer and he was quite different from me in many ways and one of the things he, he almost envied, we, we would talk for hours of course when we had time and, and he envied, I remember him thinking wouldn't it be great to come home from the war and have a march down Fifth Avenue or something like that. I guess he was saying like World War II and 
I didn't feel that way at all. I mean, I said, oh, that, it, it won't happen, it can't happen, it isn't going to happen. And I didn't resent that because my father had been in World War II and he didn't get a parade either. Uh, he just came home. There were some units, I guess, that got the full glory and the full shot, but as, as often as not, no. And, and so I never imagined that I would get a big reception or anything of the kind, but I wasn't ready for the reception I got, which was, was hatred. How did you feel about the demonstrators? I felt things? they were, I felt bittersweet. I, I felt that they were very naive. That was my first thought. And I also, I was sad because they were my age. I mean, this were, these were, this was my group, my crowd. And we were worlds apart. I would have felt better if they were a younger or older group, I guess. And then they'd say, well, maybe we have cultural differences here, but we didn't. Do you think uh, the United States <clears throat> involvement in Vietnam was justified? That's a tough one. Um, now, a lot of Vietnam veterans have, have, have all kinds of reactions. I, I have friends who are Vietnam veterans who feel that we should have done it right and gone right to North Vietnam and taken over. I, I don't. Uh, I hate to play armchair quarterback. I, I like to think, I prefer to think, and I hope I'm right about this. I guess we made a mistake. However, I think the United States went into it with honorable intentions. I think we, at the time, again, we have to put ourselves back in the mindset of the early to mid-1960s. We were very afraid of communism taking over, especially in oppressed countries. We, we saw, me in the United States, saw Vietnam as one of those oppressed countries, and we weren't going to let that happen. I don't know as that was wise. Uh, history would, sus would suggest it wasn't. But I think, we, I think we went in with honorable intentions. I think the people that served, served as well as they could under the conditions that they were under. And I wouldn't apologize for that. Uh, but if we had it to do over, I guess we should have done things much differently. Did you ever join any veterans organizations? The only thing, it's funny, is I'm, I'm middle-aged now. When I came home, uh, I didn't, I, really, I made an initial feel to the local American Legion, and I got the impression, and again, I can't, I can't say anything particularly happened, but I got the feeling that I wasn't, wouldn't be welcome in the American Legion, that I was, you know, one of those, you know, the World War II guys were the real veterans, and Vietnam veterans were a bunch of weenies, and, and again, this was 1970, and there was a lot of polarization in America everywhere, in every group, and, and so I just said, well, who needs them? I haven't gone back. I, I then went to uh, another town. I, li I worked in, a, in, a, in the Mohawk Valley for a while, and the VFW was more accommodating. I talked to them a little bit. I'd never joined, though. I just couldn't. Um, the only thing I'm a member of is, and I've only recently rejuvenated that, is as I'm a member of the 4th Infantry Division Association, which is a very low scroll, but we just you know, get a newsletter and a card, and you know, what I mean. But I, it's, I feel I have some, some contact. Mm -hmm. Do you ever stay in contact with anyone from service? Uh, directly, direct friends, no. Mm -hmm. And we knew that. I think we that was we based would. on the tour of duty that you never really. I, I no, I, I think, or I think the, the, the combat experience is very intense. And again, this is not something I haven't thought of, um, but I think the minute you leave, you know that you're probably not going to see each other again. Um, you couldn't. I can't explain it. Um, I think that's... My dad didn't either. My grandfather, I don't think, did either. And they were all 
war veterans too. Um, there's something about that when you're in a war, it's very intense, it's very concentrated, but you can't relive that. You can't bring it back. I, I don't. I, I, I may. There's many days I wonder what happened to so and so or what they're doing or where they are. Yes, but I probably won't pick up the phone and find out. How do you think your time in the military changed or affected your life? I think it was a major impact in my life. Um, and again, I, I think many veterans feel that way. Your, 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 your military time is, is, is a very significant part of your, your, uh, your life. Um, you learn a lot about yourself. You learn a lot about other people. Um, you're young, so you're impressionable. Um, and you just put all that together, and you go, wow, that was, a, that was a big piece of my life. I I don't like to regress too much. I I I don't try to. I mean, I know it's it's been a long time, and and I've changed in many ways. And but 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 to put it to sum it up, my military time was an important chapter in my life. In retrospect, just uh, after what you went through, do you think you would have gone back and, and not dropped out of war yeah, for some Yeah, of I, I was in many ways the guy at fault here. I was just a kid. I was immature. I guess I wish I'd seen it through, mm -hmm. yeah, and become that helicopter pilot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think I could have done it. I just wasn't. mentally ready, I guess, at the time. Yeah, I wonder. I wonder. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Um.